According to Nazi scientist Herbert Oberth, the Nazis were in communication with extraterrestrial beings who gave them instructions to design anti-gravity craft that would take them to the moon in 1942 before anyone else. Later, Warner von Braun, a Nazi rocket scientist responsible for many of the V-2 models that launched from the ground to destroy target destinations, said they were in contact with aliens. Many years have passed since World War II, but can there still be a chance that post-war survivor Nazis fled and created some breakaway civilization? Are these satanic psychopaths still out there? It is a thousand times more complicated, OP, than you can imagine. Germans likely had saucers, and they are either from one alien group, or they found one and built their own. There is the UFO in Italy that Grusch mentioned that Nazis got in the 1940s. But Roswell, Aztec, New Mexico, etc. Crashes were also likely real, by actual aliens. The German UFO program likely merged with Americans, because it's very likely USA built their own UFO in the 1960s. It is very complicated. Here is a UFO pick from a book called Unternemann Aldebaran. Can be found on Google. I haven't read it, but it has UFO pictures. This is supposedly a German UFO, but the pilot does not look human to me, and is similar to other UFO and alien encounters where they met short human-looking humanoids, flying saucers. The Germans have been merged, in my view, and there were likely only a few thousand of them. But there is Western-operated, in my view, secret space stuff out there. And then there is aliens. It is very complicated, but seems that 1. UFOs are real, man-made, and alien-made, but it's hard to say exactly what is what. No. The Tibet expedition failed. Entrances were found in Norway, Greenland, Nunavut, and Antarctica, though only Norway's and Antarctica were used. Aliens exist, but not in the way most think. Most are primitive, and none reached us with anything else other than radio signals. But there is an advanced race, right here, that has always been here, and has anti-gravity tech, among other things. They also use massive, artificial, gravity generators to live where they live, so it is safe to assume their ships would not have gravity issues either, and you could bring even small ones to space without ending up floating. Their generators do not require movement either, which is why we have never seen massive ships with rotating structures that would serve to generate artificial gravity. There is no doubt the Nazis built saucers with exotic propulsion tech, tech that is still classified today on a global level. The only question is what they managed to do with it. To leave Earth permanently, I think they had to have had direct help from aliens, and not just in the form of the craft recovered in Italy. It is one thing to visit the moon or another planet. It is another thing entirely to establish a permanent colony. To me, the main reason to believe they managed to do it is it would neatly explain all of the Nordic alien encounters reported over the years. Think about it. The Vril, the Glock, the base in Antarctica. Why did the Germans mine so much thorium and uranium when they weren't making a bomb? Look at Wilhelm Landig's testimony. Look at William Tompkins' testimony. What happened to Kamler? First you have your Foo Fighters appearing everywhere, which it was widely known to be the work of the Nazis, trying to use the electromagnetic field effects as small EMPs. Then you have your Battle of Los Angeles incident. 1945, the avocado shaped Glock, Trinity UFO, collecting intelligence on nuclear tests. Then you have your ghost rockets all over Europe. Then the Angle Home UFO. Then the Maury Island incident. Roswell crash, the Kenneth Arnold sightings, and thousands of other sightings, jeering, and dozens of famous ones. All the while, 
Dozens of German submarines were missing, with some of them still surrendering in Argentina in 1946. Donitz was talking about fucking Antarctic Shangri-La, and meanwhile, Operation High Jump is going on, in which Admiral Byrd gets fucking obliterated by Nazi saucers coming out of the fucking water and of the ice. This just goes on and on, and in the 1950s, you have your first cigar-shaped crafts appearing everywhere in the US. 1958, Operation Argus commences, and they try to fucking nuke the Nazis. The shit explodes midair. Uh, uh, we wanted to study the radiation effects, of course, hence why we exploded them high up. Free test, old tiny yield. Totally didn't just get blown up. Landig said the Germans defended against the nukes effectively. He also said it was all entirely German works. The year after the Antarctic Treaty declares the entirety of the continent as a no-go zone for the entire fucking planet. Suddenly, there is a suspicious, almost total pause in sightings for four years. The next report is of E.T. abduction BS. Boom. Soon after, we have the Kecksburg crash, Glock. Even Jimmy Carter saw a UFO. After JFK dies, there is another four-year gap. Again, most of the reports from that time are complete BS, talking about robots, ETs, etc. Most of the high-profile reports from the time were memory hold and completely hidden for decades. I am, of course, talking about UFOs deactivating nukes, ICBMs. Notice how this aligns perfectly with the Argus operation, the turtles, and the Glock, as well as with many of their proposed mechanisms. On top of this, a lot of reports of radiation emissions of UFOs also come from this time. It obviously mostly ended with the Antarctic Treaty, which was some kind of pact with the Nazis in Antarctica, with them routinely showing off their power. Fast forward into the 1980s, and if you believe Bob Lazar and others, the US still had not figured the saucers out, beyond being able to fly the few that they recovered. There is a video of it, by the way. It is obvious if you think about it. German science was different in that it was less constrained in normativity and depended heavily on German spirituality and ideology. The people they imported under Project Paperclip, obviously, heavily stonewalled their scientific process while giving them a bunch of outdated technology. But why would the Nazis just disappear? Because they don't have enough people. Missing persons reports, repeated abductions, abductee stories about a great plan for future mankind, cattle mutilations, etc. Notice how a breakaway civilization perfectly fits the motive. People for stopping genetic bottlenecks, sleeper agents and political actors for infiltration, agricultural research for population expansion. Ruminant meat is the most healthy food for man. Anons, wake up, they were playing the long game, slowly growing their numbers as only a few thousand were flown out to Antarctica. Now the moon is occupied, Mars is occupied, Ganymede is occupied, 30 more years, and they'll have at least 120 million citizens. The U.S. lost the war, hence why they resent and torture you so much. The Satanists are coping. I mean, don't even get me started on the famous German cavern letter and U-209. Just remember this, they are trying to use A's as a distraction from the reality so that you will be more willing to to obey them. Just imagine what would happen if people found out that the entire West was built on lies, especially with the decay nowadays, which is exactly what our breakaway civilization wants, so that it can sweep in like a damn savior wizard and revolutionize the entire developed world all at once with minimal casualties. They constantly use illogical arguments which is pure cup, as well as the SS Gambit, or everyone is trickery. 
which in reality is just poor cope. They torture you, specifically, because they know they lost, and because they know that your brothers and sisters won. Meanwhile, as their time is approaching, they are trying to destroy you, or make you destroy yourselves, trying to manipulate you into becoming insane, or trying to mislead you into standing up for false ideals, while they craft personal delusions for everyone about how the end of the world is coming. All of it is false. All of it is sadistic cope and torture that serves almost no worldly or spiritual purpose beyond causing chaos and damage. Never give up in the face of this, and know that our people, your people, have survived incredible struggles. Nothing was able to destroy us, but many have suffered and died in the process. If you try your hardest, you too will make it. Mark my words, the time is coming where the tribulations will be over and the enemy slain. Hi all, I'd like to briefly address a topic I'm sure you are all familiar with, the Glock, or the Nazi Bell aircraft. I hope that in doing so, I can clear up a few common misconceptions about the Glock. There are unlikely to be any official disclosures about this craft, in part due to its association with the excess, but also for the reasons that I will detail below. I cannot personally attest to the Glock, as I have not seen it. While this information is privileged, the falling in recent years about UFO and UAP topics has allowed more info to travel, and what I am sharing with you right now is basically gossip. A common narrative that surrounds the Glock is that the original craft, all documentation of it, and all of the personnel assigned to it were destroyed. Post-World War II Bell sightings would then be of extraterrestrial origin, presumably of the type of craft that was either salvaged into the Bell, or served as its inspiration. The value of this narrative is that it provides a convenient explanation for the U.S. never acquiring this technology in paperclip. If Americans had access to a magical, anti-gravity bell, we probably would have skipped over the V-2, and just won the space race with that. An alternative I occasionally see to the original Glock's destruction is the possibility that, like all experimental aircraft, the Glock was, slash is, extremely dangerous. Typically, this was attributed to it spewing radiation while in use, and killing its test pilots or whatever. It probably is pretty radioactive, but I have no idea how dangerous the ambient radiation from the craft is, or whether Germany or the US ever cared about that. I would have to imagine whatever risk its engine posed to a test pilot would be ignored, but I do not know. Anyway, this is brought up as a reason why the project could have been abandoned, but really is not a very solid one. My understanding is that the Glock was not destroyed by Germany. Almost no experimental weapons were themselves destroyed, and their blueprints never were, nor was it deemed unfit for use after its acquisition by the US as a result of any health risks to personnel. The US tested the Glock quite a few times, at least until the method of propulsion was understood, at which point it was retired. I am not a physicist or much of a UFO guy to begin with, so please bear with my layman's explanation of how the thing flies. Some physicists believe in the existence of a graviton, a particle that would express gravity, which we traditionally model as a wave. The thinking is that if light can exhibit wave-particle duality, then we could reasonably expect to find a gravity version of the photon. The strongest piece of evidence for the Glock's extraterrestrial origin is that while physicists have thus far failed to find the graviton, the Glock interacts directly with gravity without altering the mass of either itself or the Earth. The best way to explain the underlying mechanism of the Glock 
is to say that it does not move. It only appears to. The craft's apparent speed and typical, incredibly sharp turns are not explained by its maneuverability, but its ability to hold still. The Germans were probably unaware of this, and the US only recognized this following attempts to measure if any force was exerted on the pilot. When operational, the Glock calibrates to the most massive nearby body, favoring the Earth despite technically orbiting the Sun, and then, via unclear means, entangles a small portion of its gravitational field to that of the nearby body. The smaller, entangled portion of the Glock is the steering wheel, and any movement of this will result in equivalent movement of the entangled body. Travel is then achieved by moving the Earth around the Glock, not vice versa. The elephant in the room was how much damage had potentially been done. Nobody was charting the exact directions or distances the Glock had traveled in. Without knowing how far we had deviated, there was no practical way to use the Glock to course correct. Obviously, there would be no safe way to use it for real military applications. What if it malfunctions? What if someone falls asleep at the wheel? The decision to fly the Glock any distance has to be treated with the same gravity as the nuclear option. My opinion, to be taken with a grain of salt, is that whatever craft the Germans based it on might not have been intended for flight as we understand it. It makes much more sense as an elevator. It could transfer a spacecraft from the surface to low orbit, then quickly reverse this motion to undo any offset, allowing pilots to bypass escape velocity. I'm sure this has been considered and will never be approved. I don't plan on posting again, but I hope this is useful to someone, and feel free to continue ignoring assholes like me when they have us doing disclosures on C-SPAN. The Nazi Invasion of New York, World War II Hey X, I used to lurk here sometimes for my own entertainment. The stupid, schizoid nonsense is really funny sometimes. I have a story that might just blend in with the asshole array on this board, but I must assure you that this is not fiction. Everything I am telling you is true, or maybe I lost my fucking mind, you pick. Here goes. When I was around 8 to 10 years old, I had a passing interest in World War II. My father's parents had served in the war on the American side in the Pacific. Because of this, my father had lots of second-hand knowledge on what it was like to fight in the Philippine Islands, and my father was also a big history nerd. I remember him telling me about the Tiger tanks in great detail, specifically. You know, like one of those snapshot memories from when you were a kid, mentioning how the Tiger II was expensive, how it broke down a lot. American industry was at its strongest, blah blah blah. Anyways, I remember one time, I was asking him about how the USA was doing during the war. He told me about the failed Nazi invasion of the USA. It went something like this. Towards the end of the war, Germany was desperate and decided to go out with a bang, making one last stand against the US. They planned an amphibious assault somewhere around Manhattan, but falsified plans to attack a naval base in North Carolina. The scale of the attack was greatly over-exaggerated, and US intelligence picked up the fake plans for the attack. North Carolina was secretly fortified, and armor, weapons, infantry, etc. was sent there to defend the base. The Coast Guard even helped out. A few days before the suspected attack in North Carolina took place, Manhattan was attacked late at night, first being peppered by rounds from German ships far off on the coast. This continued for a few hours. Then came the attack. Armored landing craft strolled onto the beaches of Manhattan, and those little Volkswagen cars with MGs that the Germans used basically ran around, causing chaos. Armored landing craft 
strolled onto the beaches of Manhattan, and those little tanks that looked like small ships with tracks were unloaded. They moved up the beaches relatively undisturbed. The small amount of U.S. military that was stationed at Brooklyn was nowhere near enough to take out the Nazi infantry and did not have rounds or weaponry to take out the panzers the Nazis spammed the coast with. So that focused on evacuating the civilians. Another army base in Jefferson and Y, however, had the weaponry to take out some of the Nazi forces, but they were much farther away. And there was an airbase somewhere else with a single B-17 bomber, meaning that reinforcements would take a few hours. Hours that the army did not have, and the goal of the German attack was to cause as much damage as quickly as possible, not to capture the city, so the civvies were fair game. Before the tanks could roll up to the streets, however, they needed infantry to support them, and the German infantry was at risk of getting close to the evac site. Many of the civilians took up arms to defend the city, and fought with the army on hit-and-run style raids. This disturbed the Nazi forces for long enough for reinforcements to arrive, and in between bombing runs, which were only a few hours apart, with only one bomber. Since the civilians were untrained, however, most of them were killed. The Nazi forces eventually decided they were doomed when more and more American forces appeared. Some of the USA Navy that was stationed nearby was able to box the Nazi ships in between the city and the Atlantic Ocean, where one of them tried to flee but was destroyed in the Hudson River. The remaining forces were rounded up, captured, killed. Memorials were made for the soldiers and civilians, and a replica of the Nazi ship became a museum. The rusted remains of the real one became a tourist attraction as they were left untouched, and lots of parts of the ship stuck out from the water with rust and whatnot all over, making it a beautiful sight to see. If you've ever seen that Tom Cruise movie called Oblivion, the best way to compare what it looked like was the scene where he rides the motorcycle through the wasteland that used to be some kind of ocean. The Nazi ship looked like one of the ruined ships from that scene. I know, because I went there. And I remember it during a trip to NY with my family. We even went on the museum replica, and we looked at Nazi officer uniforms. Later on, I remember it being mentioned in all kinds of history books, and I remember my social studies teacher mentioning something about it, when he talked about the only times America was ever invaded. He was talking more about that Texas-Mexican war shit in the 1800s, though. I think I was in the 8th grade or so when I stopped hearing mentions to it. I did not really notice it at the time at all, but I remember in high school when me and my buddies were arguing some shit about America being the best country in the world. I said something about we have civilians that are like the Second Army, and I brought up the invasion of New York. They looked at me confused, obviously, and they told me they had no idea what I was talking about. Phones were around at this time, so I used mine to look it up. All I found was some bullshit about Nazi spies in the late thirties trying some shit at Long Island, and the museums and memorials simply did not exist, according to Google. I looked up some more about it, and found nothing. Of course, me and my friends laughed it off as me being a schizoid, and I tried to forget all about it. I could not ask my dad. He was dead. I could not ask my mom. She is an immigrant and has limited knowledge of U.S. history, and most of my relatives live too far away to show up just to ask. I was, however, able to find the German vehicles that were used. I will keep continuing this thread, but the capture is tearing me a new one. After lurking this board for long enough, the only explanation that I have was that I skipped universes. It sounds utterly ridiculous, but it is the only thing that makes sense to me. 
My dad could not have been fucking with me, because we went to the museum and saw the remains of the German boat. That could have been a dream, but I doubt it, because it felt too real, and the memory passes off like any other childhood memory, not hazy like a dream. Also, I saw it in some kind of history visual encyclopedia as well, not to mention the more casual references to it. I have also heard of a former history nerd about the many wild Nazi experiments and the theories about the Nazis fucking around with A's, so this makes the possibility of jumping universes a bit more plausible. I was born post 9-11, so this event was regarded similarly as a tragedy of American past, but nothing that filled my head too much, so I apologize for a lack of detail, but that was the best summary I could put together. Here is what I could find, however. Vehicles. Tank. More of an armored car. Sonder Kraftfahrzeug. 234. Special Purpose Vehicle. 234. Pick related on first post. Amphibious Armored Vehicle. Not sure what it was called, but here is an image link to the closest thing I could find. Pick related on second post. Armored Car. Volkswagen. Type. 166 Schwimmwagen, pick related on third post. Similar events. Operation Pistorius. German spies in New York in 1949. Different event, but kept popping up. Nazis planned to attack New York City with radioactive sand and failed. Americans thought that New York was bombed by the Nazis in 1942. Another different event, but also kept popping up. Nazi SS Ritual House of Horrors In the story, I have been researching the occult practices of Germany's Nazi leadership and some of the rituals associated with it. While doing so, I ran across the following information in reference to Sel Neues Rathaus. The Sel Neues Rathaus is a surviving example of Gothic architecture, although today it is only a town hall. The building, perhaps, holds a dark secret, located in the Lower Saxony region of German's heartland. Cell is a small and auspicious city. Cell Neues Rathaus, translating to New Town Hall of Cell. The edifice was occupied by the Wehrmacht in the 1940s, contained 300 rooms, and could accommodate up to 1,200 soldiers, with further accommodations for 200 officers. Five additional underground levels enhanced the capacity of the 10-story building. During Hitler's rise to power and militarization of Germany, the Rathaus evolved into a military headquarter for the SS. It wasn't until the site housed Allied soldiers that the initial reports of paranormal encounters began after the war. When the English and American forces made their push for Germany, they discovered that the Nazis had flooded and sealed the lower floors of Cell Neues Rathaus with concrete. This was of notable interest to specialized Allied units. They were aware that the Nazi regime had hidden valuable stolen artworks and artifacts in the last days of the war. Therefore, they thought treasures might still exist in the building's lower levels. The commanding officer, Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, ordered a dive expedition to investigate the lower levels of the structure. On April 15, 1945, the expedition provided vivid accounts of what Sal Neues Rathaus may have been used for. Three divers went down at separate points each of them tethered by a line. After 30 minutes under, only one man resurfaced. As told by the sole survivor of the original U.S. Navy dive team, the harrowing experience deeply affected him. Upon entering the subterranean complex, the diver claimed that he saw many sigils etched into the walls of the first and second floors. These included pentagrams, 
and other pagan occult symbols. If this was not foreboding enough, reports indicate that when he swam into the foot floor, the diver came across mutilated bodies strapped to chairs. The state of these corpses was like nothing he had ever seen. He saw vivisected abdomens, missing limbs, and animal appendages attached to several of the corpses. More specifically, some featured the heads of goats sewn onto the human bodies. He also described the mutilated bodies were moving in the flooded rooms, writhing in their chairs, trying to get out. The diver also mentioned that dark form chased him through the water during his ascent back to the surface. After this incident, the diver was never the same, refusing to ever dive again. He took a medical discharge not long after this event. The other two other divers' bodies were never recovered, although the Teva lines attached to them were. On April 21st, Sal's rat house was handed over to the British Army. Soon after, the subterranean levels were completely sealed with concrete. Soon after Cell City was liberated, the structure served as rotating barracks for Allied units moving through Germany and for those stationed in the Cell region. English and American forces remained stationed in Germany for years due to the Cold War. During the Cold War, the building became a permanent barracks for NATO troops. Soldiers' reports of paranormal phenomena around the site increased. An English infantryman named Stephen Daly said that on his first night in the barracks, he awoke to the sounds and silhouettes of a formation of men marching past his window. However, it was not until the next day that he remembered his room was on the second floor with a window more than ten feet off the ground. There were other reports of strange activity. These included the sounds of jackboots in empty hallways or on the parade ground when most of the force was on leave. Additionally, sounds of hushed German voices in vacated or locked rooms were also not uncommon. In a far more dramatic account, a private by the name of Martin Fox awoke abruptly one night to find his bed levitating eight feet off of the ground. After he realized it was not a prank, he panicked. This caused the bat to come crashing down to the floor. Subsequently, a sergeant major was out on the ground one evening and watched the ghostly form of a German panzer column move along a road next to him in complete silence. It was not uncommon for enlisted men to return to find their previously clean and secure rooms vandalized throughout this time. There were also often settings of shadowy figures in hallways and corners. Some men even claimed to have awoken to these entities standing over their beds at night. On the higher levels of the rat house, some rooms had pentagrams and odd symbols etched into the floors or walls, similar to the motifs that the frightened diver described. Official documents noted that the barracks had an unexplainable spike in medical discharges during the 1980s. Many of these resulted from psychological evaluations that determined the men were depressed, schizophrenic, or suffering from extreme acute anxiety conditions. The rate of men taking their own lives was the highest among stationed troops in West Germany. As the medical examiner recorded, there seemed to be a dark, oppressive atmosphere over the site. Cell was near the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. In the process of transporting prisoners to this camp, they would have had to change lines at Cell. On April 8, 1945, about 3,500 concentration camp inmates died in Cell on their way to Bergen-Belsen. This was the result of an Allied air raid that hit the ammunition train that had stopped next to them and exploded. A number of these prisoners were killed, while the surviving inmates fled into the town or the woods. The SS opened fire on them. The rest were hunted like animals and killed. Had the real horrific events of earlier days 
had settled near his red house, been ingrained so deeply into the area and the building. One would think that the sealed underground levels should be examined, but this action has never been undertaken.